Okay, it is a rainy, windy day. Yay! And I'd much rather can hear. stay curled up on the couch with a blanket. But for you guys, I'm going to make some Thank you, Alan. Alan. I'm excited yeah, to show you how it's It's coming done. through at, at particularly low I'm resolution, but I think it'll work out okay. Mic okay. Or an internal mic because um, it's just going to. I'm going to have to separate the phone far enough from the, the lathe that I don't have a cord that will run that long. So we're just going to make it work and we'll see what happens. There's our audience today. So when we moved here, there was this big canvas hayloft and we were going to take it down but then one day i unzipped it and discovered that there's a concrete floor and a power supply so that became my shop it's a mess but it's my mess and i love it so this is my little shop and as you can see i wear old messy clothes whenever i'm going to turn um i safety first so i pull my sleeves up today i'm really bundled up because it's chilly down here i always pull my hair back definitely don't want any loose hair around a lathe i choose to wear my glasses whenever i turn because even though i wear a shield i feel like it's one more layer of protection for my eyes and then i wear a smock which just helps to keep some of the shavings out of my clothes so, y'all yeah. are going to hear my husband's heavy breathing. He's filming. <laughs> Sounds like a stalker. Shops are a lot cleaner than mine, but this is my mess and I kind of like it. Uh, I can come down here and hang out and make cool stuff. So, most of you probably are not familiar with wood turning, so I thought it might be nice to show a little bit more of what it's like to turn a bowl to you since you may know encaustic painting a little better than you know this. So I'm just going to run through what it takes to turn a bowl. This is basically a log that was sliced in half with a chainsaw and then turned around a little bit, either on a bandsaw or just with the chainsaw taking off the rough edges. Now it's possible to start with something that's perfectly round because of the bandsaw, but um, because this is not, we'll have to turn it round, which is just a process. So I start by finding the center, and I've just got this handy dandy little center finder, and I put it on here, and once I figure out where's mostly the center, then I'll mark it with my marker. That helps me shortcut the step. So then I just take that center. This is going to be the inside of the bowl. This is going to be where I shaped the outside of the bowl. So I want to put that on the lathe and pinch it. You to get this as close as you can. And this surprisingly can be one of the most challenging parts because these slices of wood aren't always light. Uh, this lathe will accommodate a bowl that's up to 16 inches and a hunk of wood that's going to be turned down to, to a, a bowl that size can be really heavy and unwieldy. And I'm usually down here alone, so I have to manage to hold that in place and then pull this and get it to hold. So. That is pretty close to being centered. And then I just look like this. I'm going to move it just a little bit. I can continue to move this when I get to the design stage. And that's one of the things I love about bull turning is that the wood continues to get a voice in what it becomes. So it's going to have bark that I have to work around. Sometimes I'll choose to include it. Sometimes I'll turn it completely away. If I leave some, it can make a little bit of a challenge whenever I'm at the end and want to add finish because bark obviously is very porous and can also peel away in the future. So um, this is a piece, I think, of 
I've, I've had it for a little while, so and I didn't mark it. It's either black locust or a honey locust. It could be Bradford pear. I'll be able to tell a little bit better whenever I get into it. So let's get started. I want to make sure that this thing is pinched really, really well because once it starts flying, you don't want it flying at your face. You do have them come off every now and then. Every wood turner has experienced that. But you try to use all the wisdom that you can to keep it from happening. So it looks like I got that mostly centered. It's going to be a bumpy ride in the beginning until it's round. And that's fine. I'll use my speed a little bit more slowly at the beginning, and as it's round, then I can speed up. So it's really important to start with a sharp tool. I've already sharpened this. Different woods dull the tool at different paces, and so I may sharpen often, or may get away with not having to sharpen those often. Let's see what happens. very unusual for me to turn without music. Usually I've got music blaring as loud as it'll go, but I'm gonna leave it off for filming today. Some people say not to wear a glove. Um, I wear a glove with the fingertips cut out and I make sure not to put it where it doesn't belong so that it never gets snagged, but it helps because sometimes when the shavings are coming off, it comes off so hot on your hand that it can literally burn your hand. So I can tell from how hard this is that this is definitely black locust, which is a really beautiful bowl but it's far, far harder to turn than the Bradford pear, and it dulls the tool a lot faster. So I'll be having to sharpen my tool very quickly. I'm gonna try to flatten off the bottom so I can create a way to grip the wood when I flip it around and core out the inside. sharpen the tool. Let's do that. Okay, this is a jig that helps me get the right distance and the right angle every single time so that I can just very quickly come under here and sharpen this tool. You want to take as few passes as possible, and that way your tool lasts longer. It's called a Rikon Bench Grinder, low speed. Now I have a sharp tool again. So this is one of those times when you have to make design choices. So you can see there's bark here, there's a ton of bark here, seems pretty stable, and I'm round. So I have to decide, do I want to design this in such a way that I'm going to scoop all that bark off, which is probably going to make an OG shaped bowl, or am I going to leave bark on the exterior? I really like this bark, um, I think it adds a lot of character. So. I may leave it, but first I have to design the shape of my bowl. So you might think that we're ready to go. I've got it round, so why not leave that as the bowl? Well, this is what we call a dog dish in the wood turner world. It's got no finesse, no elegance to the shape. You basically want a bowl that's going to just melt into the table in a perfect continuous curve. And this instead has very flat sides and is very boxy. 
So I'm gonna start to shape around this side. Kind of a bummer, I'll probably lose that, which I really like as a design feature, but I need to shape this round so that it will meld into the bottom now. And I might lose a lot of that bark too, we'll see. your base to be a third of the overall diameter of the bowl. So I'm just going to measure the diameter and it's eight. So it's going to be about right there. So I just kind of mark that in my mind. Just give it a little divot. And that tells me that as I'm shaping the outside of the bowl, I want it to head in the angle to where it's going to hit that final diameter. So a little bit more. Another tip is that I don't want any flat spots on my side. I want it to be a nice angle. So I just take something that's flat and roll it around the edge to see if it flattens out anywhere. And it does, it flattens out right there. So I need to make sure that I continue to round that so that there's no flat spot. I can do the inside. And that means that I have to take this part off completely, lay it aside, and then this comes out. This is just a little four prong thing that was holding it before. And now I'm going to put this big four jaw chuck. This thing is really heavy, and that's good because you want it to securely hold this way. This is going to go in here, and open it up to clamp it. We'll open wider and wider there. Okay, now that fits in there securely, now I'm going to reverse and just clamp it down nice and tight. Go around a couple of times, always make sure that that sucker is secure. Okay, now we're ready to find the rim and do the outside. Okay, so my bowl has been completely designed on the outside, and what I did on the outside is going to really dictate what I can do on the out inside, because the inside should match the line of the outside. So I left this really cool bark on the outside. That means we're not going to have a completely round rim. It's going to interrupt the bark. Um, and I'm, I don't know yet how thin I'm going to go. That bark is really going to determine once I get in there whether I want to leave it or whether I want to take it. So, um, and then this has to be flattened out so that it's nice and solid. I left that part in. You can see there's a big crack going through it, so that may or may not survive. You just never know. It's an evolving process, which is part of the fun. I think someone's not on mute who maybe just came in the room. Can everybody mute, please? Hey, JC, can you manually... 
Can you manually mute whoever's not muted? Thanks. sensitive to is how deep I'm going so that I don't go through the bottom of the bowl. There's still plenty of room right now. I kind of eyeball it and compare. There's at least two or three fingers that I can go deep. class of David Ellsworth, who is a master wood turner, they call him the grandfather of wood turning, and he taught me something called the suicide cut, which gives you a really nice clean cut at the end, but it doesn't always go well, so we'll see how it turns out. Wish me luck. is the same all the way around. And so I start here and I just slide it around. And if the distance right here stays the same, then I'm good. It gets a little thick back at the back, so I'll thin that out some more. I want ultimately to be about that diameter. This feeling great. Let's see how we're doing on our depth. It looks perfect. So now I'm going to sand it a little bit and I'm not going to sand the outside because the outside we're going to do encaustic wax process on, but I'm going to sand the inside so that it'll look.
We lost the audio. <clears throat> Did you mute the yeah. audio? JC? We saw that you clicked something on the YouTube video. Did you inadvertently mute the audio in the YouTube video? Well, I can just walk you through what I was saying. There was a crack that came from the outside to the inside, and so I glued that. Yeah. Pardon? Okay, now I am taking it off to flip it around and continue shaping the outside of the bowl. Now I have to take that base off and continue the smooth curve around to the bottom. If you solve the audio, then I'll let it jump back in. I like to pad between the bowl and the and what is basically a jam chuck so that it doesn't mar the inside of the bowl as I press it back into tight grip. So there's a little nub with a center already marked on the bottom that makes it super easy to line back up and because you want it to be perfectly round as round as you can so that you're not out of round that creates big problems so now i'm just going to go in and remember where i said i had to take that curve down to the smaller diameter i'm just going to continue on shaping around that arc so that i end where i want to at the bottom this is always a little unnerving because there, there is a chance that you will guesstimate it wrong and go through the bottom of the bowl. That has certainly happened. I have a wall of shame in the background that you can't see, but they're basically funnels that were supposed to be bowls. Uh, this is um, just taking that tenon that held the bowl in the reverse off and shaping it so that it's got a really nice curve. When it goes well, it's a beautiful thing. It's been a while since I've made a, a funnel, but I'm on a lot of groups on Facebook. I know a lot of experienced turners, far more experienced than I am, and it happens to everyone. You get a little overexcited or just miscalculate. And so I'm undercutting slightly on the bottom. If I didn't and the bowl changed with moisture in the air at all, you wouldn't have a perfectly flat, um, it wouldn't settle perfectly flat onto the table. We'll cut it just a little bit and that takes that out of play. What I did to heal the crack, we lost the audio on that, but um, you basically take sh uh, dust from your turning and fill the crack with that and then fill it with CA glue and then sand it back down. So now I'm just whittling away that nub. This too is a little unnerving because if you turn it through and it goes flying, you might destroy your bowl. So I get almost to the bottom, almost all the way through, and then I take a little saw and just saw the difference and then sand that nub down. So this is... Blink. Now I'll just sand that away and it's a bowl. So Remind me after we do the encaustic work on it to add oil to it because I really want you to see what black locust looks like with oil on it. So I left a little bark on there, which people love. Wood turners don't always love it. They don't consider that, um, uh, I don't know, a lot of people won't even chainsaw wood like I do and just go from green wood. They, they purchase wood that is... Um, that doesn't have the issues. So, that but I. Is great. Hey, <laughs> everybody, now Cheryl's going to do live. And you know what? If Alan, you're still there, thank you so much for staying with yeah, us. Yeah, so y'all can. <laughs> okay, Cheryl, take it away. Thank everybody, you, Alan. Get yourself on speaker view and you'll get Cheryl, I mean, in the middle. 
you can spotlight her. If you just, if you click on her video and choose spotlight, then everybody will see her. Got it. Da, da, da. Awesome. Okay, so I will take questions now before we show the second little clip that I sent. Um, JC, I'm assuming that you have that one too. And, um, and it's just literally one minute exactly. But any questions about wood turning? That was you got really to hear. Interesting. I love your video. And the next video it was only music on the back of it, right? It, I didn't hear you talking in that video. Yes, well. correct. There's, yes, that's correct. It's just a quick little intro to the encaustic. But you got to hear all of the loud sounds of my shop, which is one of the reasons why I like to play the music. It distracts me. It, it reminds me of that grating noise that you used to get when the internet first came out and you had a modem. <laughs> There's so many screeches and whatnots as you're shifting equipment. And so thank you for... So what, for got, great what got you interested in this in the, to begin with? Because you had the shop? Or did no, you already no. interested in... Oh, look, I can do it in here in this big room. And when I moved here, I had a hammer because it was blue and cute. And I can't even say that I knew how to use it well. So nothing. I have no history with a dad or an uncle or a grandfather, anyone with a shop. Never had shop in school. Back in the day, you know, they really didn't even encourage girls to take shop. But I did shop and buy bowls as decor. And it just, you know, I mean, we're creative types. And so you can look at something and say, that just looks like I could do it. And I always assumed that it would be a manual carving function. I'd never heard of a lathe. I literally walked into a Rockler by accident in Rockland. And I was just fascinated that there was such a thing as a woodworking store. I've always been that girl that would prefer to go to Lowe's or Home Depot instead of the mall. I'm just always curious about the different things that could be created. And so I went in and I asked, you know, what, what is a lathe? What does it look like? And they showed me and they humored me for a few minutes, but it was obvious that I wasn't buying that day. And I said, well, is there somewhere that I could learn? Is there somewhere, is there, you have wood turners who come here. Can you give me somebody's phone number and I'll call them? They're like, no, lady, we're not going to give you someone's personal information, but there are clubs around. So I went out to the parking lot that day, and I don't even think we had lived here a week or two yet. I didn't know anyone. We moved out here sight unseen, didn't know anyone. And so I had lots of time. So I sat in my car, and I Googled wood turning clubs, and I found that not only was there one in Sacramento, but its monthly meeting was that night. So it was in a couple of hours, so I texted my husband, and he's such a good man. He's used to getting texts like this from me. I'm going to a wood turning meeting tonight. Of course you are, Cheryl. So I went, and during that meeting, I'm just they had a little demo of whatever they were turning that night, and I was just fascinated. I was in the front row, and they made an announcement that they mentor students in a local school for challenged students. And one of the privileges that they can earn through good behavior is learning to wood turn. And they needed just live bodies there as chaperones. They just needed some more adults to show up for this program. And they said, and you don't even have to know how to wood turn. Um, we just need someone there. You can learn along with the students. Well, bazinga. <laughs> so not only did I stumble into that meeting, but Three days later, I was basically teaching students, not even having a clue how to hold a tool. So I learned alongside of them and then became, you know, just kind of grew into the role of teaching those students and discovered that there are actually three local wood turning clubs. One's in Sacramento, one is in Auburn called Foothill Wood Turners, and one is in Nevada City, which I'm now the president of. So I belonged, I joined all three, and I discovered this wonderful world of mentors. So these guys, it's it's mostly guys. There are very few women who do this. I'm just delighted that more women are beginning to have an interest. Um, there's a, a subset of the national organization called Women in Turning, and so they're, you know, we're out there. But um, 
so I, where was I? I went and cha cha cha. Well, we'll just jump. That. See, I can't. I cannot divert even a little bit, or else I lose what I was saying. Um, so I, I just oh mentors. Yeah, mentors. They, they will let you um, into their shops and watch what they do, and that helped me a lot. So I turned this one little bowl at the home of a mentor the first week, and one of my neighbors threw a party for us so that we could meet some people who might like adventure like we do and some of the things that we like like hiking and there was a girl there and I ran home and I brought my little show and tell you know I had this little bowl that I turned and I was so excited about it and it's such a horrible little bowl and I adore it um, and this girl comes racing over from the kitchen my dad's a wood turner and he would love to teach you well, I was going to call him. I was really excited about that connection, but I didn't have to. The next morning before I even got out of bed, my phone was ringing and this guy was calling me saying, come on over. He's 89 years old. And I spent probably the next eight weeks for five hours a day at their house in their garage. His wife is a saint. She put up with me just being there hovering. And and now we're like family and he taught me and he had never been taught he doesn't sell his work it's absolutely beautiful um he taught me everything wrong wrong you know it's 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 completely different where bowls should should you know be side grain to go with the grain all of these rules of wood turning he didn't know any of that and so he did it different but his work was spectacular and he's very meticulous about his finishing and his refining and and I've taught him some things along the way that you know I've learned about design and you know not doing the dog dishes now there's a role for those your dog would like it um, I also you know I have some that I throw rolls in at Thanksgiving and they hold more you know so I'm not trying to gun down any particular design but if you want elegance you know there's there's a way to achieve that so that's kind of been my journey I just threw myself in because I could and that introduced me to people in the community and through wood turning I got onto the Placer County Studio Artist Tour which we talked about earlier and that kind of got me introduced to other artists and other genres and it's just you know this is our home we love it we um I don't think that we could love it more. I hiked a couple hundred miles of the Pacific Crest Trail last year, so we have all of the adventure we can possibly handle. I'm getting on trail again this year to do some more, and it's beautiful, and the people are, are here because they want to be, which I think is an important distinction. This is where a lot of people retire, because it's a wonderful place to retire. So I know we don't have all day, and honestly, I could take half a day to tell you what I've learned about wood turning and encaustic. I'm, I'm relatively new, com you know, comparatively to encaustic, but I was always curious about what it would be like to do it on bowls. And I couldn't find any encaustic bowls. And how often is there anything that you Google and you can't find something? So I just really got excited. I, I did this um, big road trip back after I was newly road wood turning and I crossed country. So I was bringing my Jeep out from our home in Georgia and I drove cross country and I threw something out on the Facebook page for wood turners. And I said, hey, I would love to turn a bowl in every state that I pass through. And so I got these invitations and sure enough, I did it. And I wrote an article for the National Wood Turning Magazine about that adventure and experience. And so I, I wrote that editor and I was like, Josh, I've discovered something that nobody's doing. This is, this is so fantastic. And I think it's gonna be perfect because encaustic has been around forever. Uh, it's literally the oldest um, pigment binder that exists. It was used like fit, fifth century BC um, by the Greeks and they they did um, mummy portraits or portraits to go you know on mummy sarcophagus yada yada it's old so it's been around forever and you know encaustic artists they're very just talented there in the museums it's a time-honored form of art 
you just don't see it on bowls too much, um, which I couldn't get because it's done largely on a wooden substrate and only they're typically not 3D. So I wrote Josh and I was like, I've got an article and he wrote me back and he said, well, let me introduce you to Helga Winter, who has demonstrated for the National Wood Turners on encaustic bowls. He's written a magazine article for our magazine about it. So there's nothing new under the sun. I was not the first, um, but there aren't many who are doing it. And she has stopped turning. She's older now. She's still an encaustic artist. That's still her passion. Uh, I just like trying to combine these two things. And it's not particularly logical because it is a curved surface. I can see why not everybody wants to do it, um, even if it occurred to them, because when wax melts, it runs off and that's a challenge. So it's more challenging than doing typical encaustic painting. Uh, but I just want to run you through, and since we don't have forever, um, I just kind of want to walk you through. I've, I've set up for a demo, but I don't know that I'll actually get to to physically do something let me just quickly show you some of the things that i've done i, I want to show uh, i'm going to share screen and just show you some of the images i went looking for what the possibilities might be when i couldn't find any encaustic bowls i just made a file an idea file of encaustic pieces that I thought might translate well to encaustic. If you are someone who is fixated on control, then look away because it's impossible to control encaustic. It's, it's just the dynamic of wax melting and it moves. And so you can do certain things. Um, you can use tape, you can, you know, there are certain techniques that you can use to have some semblance of control, but it's never going to be like your typical painting. But I want to just show you some of the, let's see, which screen I need to be on here. I'm just going to show you, and, and this is a little, um, you know what, not hit, hit record, and I was going to record this, but that's okay. I won't worry about it. And there, I've made so many mistakes, it's probably better that I'm not. I'm going to share screen. Oh, it's disabled. Is it possible for you to, to enable me, JC, as, a, as an admin or something? I you just, know what? Let's just don't even do that. Did you do it? Well, I looked and it then it's not giving me that option and Alan dropped okay. off. I, I looked through all of it and it doesn't have share screen ability, so I don't really know what to do unless I make Okay, it. well, we're just going to... Okay, well then we will skip the idea file, although I think it would be, uh, you, what, would you, what you would find in there is a lot of abstract, um, just a lot of abstract paintings across the board that I think would lend themselves well to the proportions of a bowl and the inability to control it. Uh, why don't you go ahead and show that little intro video that I sent you and I'll pull up some things that I can show. And everybody, remember, this has got music, but no, she's not talking on it, just so we yeah. all know. myself on mute or not. You can hear me, right? Can you hear me? Can everybody else? 
Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to just show you a few things. Let me just switch to here. And I'm just going to show you a few of the things that I have done. These are wood turned items. This is something that was wood turned by one of my mentors up in Nevada City. And it's just a cool wall plaque. And I applied encaustic wax to the recesses in it and then blended some of the colors. And I love how that kind of came out as a sunburst. And again, you don't always know exactly what's going to happen. Um, this is just something that I practice on. I wanted to turn something that had a wide flat rim that would give me a nice surface for encaustic and also a recess to where I could see how the wax would puddle. What I discovered is that it's a really good idea to use a level if you want your if you want it to puddle in a particular way. There was another occasion when I wanted it to puddle sideways. So this was to be a bowl and as you can see on the it just had a portion break out and so there was no way for me to turn it between centers the way that I had. Um, there we go. So this is my statement on COVID. This is just kind of my artistic interpretation of a world that has been coming apart at the seams and bleeding from the inside out. And so all of this is covered in encaustic medium, which is clear. I did emphasize these black lines throughout the piece. And then I filled this with red and I tilted it like that while it dried so that when it sits upright, you can't really tell at this angle on the camera, but it's slanted. Right. This is a piece that, again, I'm just really fascinated by the wide rim idea. Um, and you can see on here, this is one of the things that I love about encaustic versus other painting is you can't hand people most paintings and say, manhandle this, touch it. I want your grubby oils from your fingers all over it. But actually your hand oils enhance encaustic wax. It gives it more of a glow. And then you can take your sleeve or you can take pantyhose. I don't know if that's going to show up on there, but it will gleam it to a high, high shine. So when I do demos in person, I will pass this around the room and just there, there's some of the shine um, and just encourage people to touch it. So you don't have to go back and refinish it. And this was a piece where I was um, working on layers and, and whatnot. All right, this, and this is something that I'm going to put an encaustic on and I haven't yet. So it's a box that I turned. And so to me, the possibilities are endless. It's only as limited as your imagination, honestly, what you could apply color to. And I love that you guys are artists. So I normally do this presentation to wood turning groups and they're artists. We're artists. Sure. We're creative. We have to make a lot of creative choices but they don't necessarily get art. So art for the sake of art, you know, beauty for the sake of color. And uh, so I love that you guys do because you can, you're a little more open-minded about, um, about ideas. So this being another one, this was just a pedestal. And so when I do a bowl, let me just show you. I've got this one taped off. This is the bowl that I turned in that video and I taped off the parts that I was not going to wax and I need a pedestal so that I can use the heat dryer to fuse the wax. Fusing is necessary. You have to think of it as a biscuit and you know how with the pastry, your layers will just peel away from each other, but a biscuit is more condensed and solid. And you really want that. You don't want your layers peeling away, which is why 
Uh, you, you really can't do acrylic. Acrylic is the only no-no because it's more, it's closer to a plastic and the layers will peel away from it. So you can use oil, you can use watercolor, just about anything else, graphite. Um, but anyway, so I use a pedestal. I had this pedestal. Well, this is one of the first bowls that I ever turned. And as you can see, it's incredibly broken and punky. This is called spalting, which is a, a bacteria process. Um, and I realized that it, it was never going to be a bowl, but there was something about it that I really liked and it was early on and it had all this cool, these cool features on it. So when I started doing encaustic, I, I thought it would make object. So I, I put the red on it and then I used something called black and you can make your own. So I have a sack of shellac flakes. Under. This is just a sack of shellac and you can take this and put it in denatured alcohol, which is what I've done, and make your own shellac. So then shellac is highly flammable, but it has really cool features that if you uh, apply a torch to it, that it will separate and I actually have a piece that I will show you let's see if I can find it right here this is shellac on encaustic wax so just painted it over the over the color this actually is one that a friend of mine um, did she's a she's a local artist and she's very very talented and doesn't that look cool and would that not look amazing on a bowl so, so I started it on this. We took it outside and torched it. Don't ever do um, anything with, with this burning shellac in your studio because it's highly flammable. Charlotte told me never to do it in my studio. So of course I did anyway. And of course it caught on fire and that was a mad scramble. Um, so I won't do that again, but it, it releases fumes. You shouldn't do it inside anyway. Another local friend of mine, Chris, is a jeweler, and so I had her make me just a little, let's see, let me make sure I'm on the camera, just a little copper top that would go in because there was a flat depression there. So I'm not done with the colors on this one, but you guys get that that is a mushroom. That is like a functional piece of art, and it might only thrill me. But every time I look at it, I love that I salvaged something and that I got to keep it and that it represents different stages of my journey. And then when I need a pedestal, I can take that off quickly and use it. So functional art is my favorite. This is another case in point that um, we have a lot of discards when we're bowl turning, things that crack too heavily or they're just never going to be a bowl. Uh, well, I discovered that it makes an awesome business card holder and I'll apply encaustic to the outside to brighten it up. This is one that I did um, that you saw in that little preview video. And basically what I did was created with permanent marker, permanent lines, um, all the, the lines that followed the natural lines of the bowl. And then I added oil pastel. No, no, that's not the right order. So then I put the encaustic over it. I intentionally left parts of it natural. So this is natural wood grain here. And then I used um, oil pastel and filled in these lines. And I wanted to do that. I could have done it on the wood itself, but I really wanted the colors to be as vibrant as possible. So all I did after I applied that color was a light fuse to seal it all together with the heat gun. So, and that might not be everyone's cup of tea, but these are insanely popular. People like a burst of color in their homes. So, and you also don't judge my bowls because I, do practice techniques on bowls that I turned early on that, you know, have obvious flaws to them and, but I like them, so I keep them. This is a box that I made 
it says create. So I used stamps. You could use stamps with encaustic really easily. You can use stamps like this. You can use letters, whatever you want to. You can even write on the wax and then fuse it. I have a lampshade uh, at my cabin that is a letter to my guests. So it's just a greeting and I wrote all the way around the lampshade. I could see how you could easily do that in encaustic wax for, you know, on a vase or or something just just to to greet people or as gifts. So happy graduation, happy birthday, I love you, you know, whatever it might be. So this little box is actually a top spins and it's not going to spin perfect right here because of all of my clutter but I left the little spinny part um, natural and then put encaustic wax on the rest and both of these are wood turned items there are endless color combinations that are possibilities I tend to like the muted colors, but the bright colors are really popular too. So I let you just let the, the layers peek out from underneath. This is a hollow form that was wood turned and I applied encaustic to the outside of it and then also used India ink and just kind of smeared it around. I was curious to know what would happen when heat was applied to it and it looks very much like fireworks I think but so again I these are statement pieces. This one is kind of hard to put in the camera. Let me switch back over here. So this was actually a collaborative piece for a women in turning challenge and we were given we were we drew certain sets of words and you had to collaboratively create a piece that represented that uh, so this is what we came up with it was two other artists in the sacramento area that are wood turners and i collaborated on this so i'm going to take this off so that i can show you the wood turned part with the encaustic and i'll go back to here so this is a nest and that's a that's resin on the inside but this is a bowl that i turned and then i applied wax the encaustic wax to it and then i went out of the yard and i grabbed up a bunch of stuff that i thought any bird would be proud of so there's leaves and flowers and sticks and twigs and paper becomes beautifully luminous when you cover it in the wax and fuse it um, and made a nest and i also had eggs that i turned you could do this as a as an Easter centerpiece, you know, you could use color or you could have a natural nest and then color the eggs on the inside. All the possibilities. So this happened, this cool edge occurred because it was upside down as I fused it and everything started dripping off, but it stuck there and the color was running into these little peaks and I just loved it so much that I left it. So let me put that back together. It was a statement piece on biodiversity, but um, let's see. And then probably one of my favorites, this one is a piece that I turned and then Bill Lum painted it for me. So let's see which way I need to go. That way. So this is actually a casein painting by Bill. I first put encaustic gesso on it, which this is, it's not a typical gesso because again, you want to steer clear of acrylic, but this is an encaustic gesso and it gives you a nice flat surface if you want your colors to pop. You can paint anything. You could paint oil paints, you can, he didn't have a lot of success with watercolor. Now I did this in watercolor and this is this was just something I was messing around before a club meeting and I created a stamp and um, so stamped around it and that was watercolor directly on the gesso and it worked fine but it didn't for him so he so he did it in gesso but isn't that beautiful so 
So I covered that in encaustic wax after he painted it, and then I came back inside. This is pine, which I don't find beautiful, but I love to do encaustic processes on it because I don't mind covering up that wood grain. I, I have a really hard time covering up the normal, just beautiful wood grain of so many of the beautiful trees that we have around here. And I put, so I used a, a butterscotch, a faint butterscotch color on the inside. And I will probably, I'm, I'll, I'll continue to work on this because this still has some trim that has to be done. And but, so I love that. Um, I want to show you these boards. So these are basically the same as the file that I couldn't open up and show you the pictures. There are a few bowls in there that I turned that I only have pictures of because I gave them for Christmas presents. So unfortunately I can't show you those, but they're really cool. These are just some of the things that you can do with encaustic and come over here. And these could easily translate to bowls. So again, these here, a group of artists, so you get the possibilities. Um, you could do simple floral. What I love is that you can do a board and then if it doesn't turn out the way you want, there's all this mark making and everything, it just becomes the background for a future project, even on a bowl. You're probably all familiar with encaustic, so I don't mean to be telling you stuff that you already know, but this is what I meant when I said that you can create some level of control if you tape things off. Um, so you can have defined lines. This is a board that I took, so you wouldn't think this is a wood turned object, but it is because these are shavings off of my wood turnings. So this is eucalyptus shavings, but you have lots of different shades that you could mix. You could mix the colors of your wax. I hang this on my wall and I have to tell you that I just feel pleasure every time I look at it because it combines things that I love. Okay, we already did that one. This, you know, just little, cha -cha -cha -cha, there we go, just little abstract flower pots. Um, I like things that are cheerful. Now this is, I saw someone do an acrylic painting on a, on a panel and I just was curious to know what that would look like in encaustic wax. So uh, I did the same thing where I used the oil pastels and created the same image. To me it looks like a sunburst or a colorful piano. You could put a name up here, you could use stamps but I think that would play well on a bowl. Um, this is just to show you that you can use photography and enmesh it in, in, in caustic. So these are images that I shot down in Southern California during poppy season. And this is actually a, um, a thing printed on tissue and embedded. So you can kind of see her little face in there. This is another one that has, a, that says hope. This is kind of another um, COVID piece. So I made the cloud white because I do like to believe that this is gonna end, but I feel like we've just had this cloud hovering over us for a while. And so that is a stamp that was stamped from this and then fused more possibilities. This is interesting and not quite sure where I actually put the napkin. I was going to show you in particular that you can take a napkin and peel it so that it is single ply and embed it in the, the wax. And look at that. You would never guess that was a napkin. More. You can do scenes, nature. This will be the background for something ahead. This is just very colorful play. Some people just like white with speckles of color showing up from underneath the background. And you can make that as pronounced or as subtle as this. You can have a highly textured surface or you can have a perfectly smooth surface. 
you can use um, oil sticks. So that is just oil stick directly on wood and then covered in clear and caustic medium, which is very beautiful. I like that because it enhances the natural wood grain. All right, I'm going to set these aside. Oh, there's that napkin. <laughs> You can get uh, light panel boards if you're, you know, obviously that doesn't apply to both. If you don't want the wood grain like this and you don't really want to have to gesso it, you can also buy them where they're already white. You will see as I walk you through the supplies that you need a heated plate for heating your waxes and they need to be at a particular temperature. So the Happy spot is between 180 and 210 degrees. They do make in caustic heat plates. They are pretty expensive. I use a pancake grid, people do. And you want to have an adjustable dial. So it's very important that you're able to control your temperature because you don't want to go so hot that you smoke. You just want it to be just hot enough to, to melt your waxes. Now, you'll see, so this is my plate of waxes, and you can see there's a little dial in the background that uh, lets me set the temperature exactly, but just to make sure that I'm accurate, I usually use this little grill top thermometer, and it lets me track. The, tracking your temperature is pretty important. Now, you can see that there's a variety of colors on here. Each gets its own paintbrush. You want um, natural bristle. Let's see. There you go. You want a natural bristle paintbrush because it will melt. That would not be good. Um, and it you can go from in here. Now these are like cake making Wilton pans, I think. And then this little guy here is something that you can buy as, directly as encaustic paint, which is called a hot cake by Encausticos. Encausticos is actually where the word encaustic comes from. A lot of people think it means caustic, which is not at all what it means. It just means to burn in. You can also use, the, these are tuna cans. So just clean out your can and reuse your tuna. So anything that's metal. I have little pans that have dedicated colors in them and then I just once they dry you can stack them up and sit them to the side you can go directly off of the plate itself and create new colors or new color mixes um, go directly from that to the bowl now whenever I take all of these off there's a mess left behind and instead of just cleaning it up which you can do you can put um, whoops Let's see, there we go. You can put uh, soy wax on there and help clean it up, or you could just take a paper towel. I usually use a paper towel because I have discovered, I'm not one to throw things away, you can take this grubby mess and use it as fire starter when you're building campfires and, and whatnot in your backyard. Um, but you can also, I don't know if you guys are like I am, but sometimes I think my palette is prettier than whatever it is that I'm painting. You can lay this down on top of what is basically a palette. This is just a Japanese paper, whoops. And you can peel this right off like a monoprint and you can frame this. People like splashes of color in their house, at least I do. So I keep those. Um, let's see, just a few more, let me walk you through a few more supplies since we're on that. You, what you really have to have is a heat source. So you have to have, you have to have the pancake griddle or something to melt your waxes on, something to put your waxes in and your brushes. And then especially, you need a heat gun. So fusing is a necessary step for this to work. Otherwise, everything will peel apart. Um, you do not want to use a hair dryer because a hair dryer is not hot enough and a hair dryer blows the air around too much. That'll create air bubbles 
in your wax. This is super hot. It is designed for taking wallpaper off of walls. So I got it at Ace Hardware. They do also make encaustic um, heat dryers, but you know, it's just always added expense and I don't see the point. Now you do want to have multiple settings, at least two. You want there to be a high and a low because you want to go as low as possible. If there's only one speed, you might not have a way to dumb it down. You want to be really, really careful about that. this. So let's talk about safety for just a second. This sucker does not cool down quickly. So you'll set it down and you'll forget about it. You'll be doing other stuff and then you bump into it randomly and you'll burn yourself. So that's a be careful of. One of the wood turners asked if he could let his kids help with a project like this because he thought, oh, painting, that's perfect. Honestly, there's nothing caustic about it, which is what his concern was. Um, it's beeswax and Damar resin, and that's all encaustic medium is. This is Damar resin. Let's see. There we go. Looks like a piece of candy. It's just a tree resin. Um, so it's the two of those put together and the reason that the the resin is such an important thing is it hardens it it keeps it from being too malleable and too soft it will cure over the course of a couple of weeks like quickly as soon as you take it off of the heat you'll find that it locks in place which is why where you work has to be right next to your waxes they have to be very accessible to each other because it dries so quickly. But it won't harden, harden for a day or two, and then over the course of a couple of weeks, it will cure. It's never fully beyond um, continuing to work on because a little bit of heat and it melts again. You want to be full if you're transporting them in your soften. I don't even hang them. and I knew it would deteriorate in the weather and that's the worst that happened. So the wood cracked because of the temperature changes but the wax was intact except at those cracks. So it did not melt off. You don't have to be overly concerned. You just have to be aware. So be careful about this. Don't lay it on just anything. My husband works in the architecture field and construction and, and so we have these let me just pick this thing up. It's really heavy. They're basically um, this is what I put my pancake and you always want, just in case, to have one of these at your disposal. So I've never had to use it, but I always have it in the drawer right beside me. You also want the air to be moving. So right now I'm doing a demo. I've got my windows closed to control light, um, but normally I would have the window open, the door open. I have a little converted shed for, for my art studio. Um, so the, and then I have a fan which I think I can show if I open up the room a little bit. Uh, yeah, you can't really see it up there. It's up there. So I just have a little tabletop fan and that moves the air through because you don't want to be inhaling the stuff. If you do pyrography or anything where you have a little fan for that, it's probably adequate as long as it's moving through. Um, let's see. Those are the only safety things that I can think of. A few more supplies to get your paints. There are a number of different ways. So let's go to here. So these are blocks of encaustic paint and you can just get these at uh, the art supply store. There's a university art in Sacramento. You can order them off of Amazon. These are called RNF. That's widely regarded as the best company for, for materials. You can get them in a number of colors. And then that's what this is. You just take your hot pan and you plop it in there. You could also unpeel it and put it on that hot plate and just go directly off of it, almost like a, but you have to remember, 
slightly warm your surface if you want it to spread easily because you're putting hot on to, to cool. Another tip, because the materials are not cheap, is you can um, dilute them with clear encaustic medium and make them stretch much, much further. When I first started, I was going directly off of these things and you just go through it pretty fast. But now I know to put mostly encaustic medium and a little bit of color goes a long way. And then I just continually add, um, let's see. So this is, this is kind of nice. So these shavings are, it's basically drippings off of the bowl. So whenever I put this up on my pedestal, like so, and I paint on my wax and then I fuse it with the gun, it's gonna drip off onto the wax paper. I keep wax paper in business. So I order them by the, I, or, I order wax paper bulk. Um, then you can just peel this right off of the wax paper once it cools and I drop it in here and then I drop it and rejoin it. I use a lot of craft sticks which are basically popsicle sticks. I use it to stir the, the wax so I'll just keep the little sticks and stir it as I go. Um, I, there are a few tools that, you know, you just don't really have to buy too much. You can look around and use what you've got, especially since y'all are artists. Um, this is actually a dentist pick. So let me switch back down to here. So I have dentist picks, little pottery shaping tools. These scrapers are really useful. You can scrape back layers and create interesting effects. This is a bamboo rod. This is great if you're using India ink and want to just do random mark making. I have a variety of paintbrush sizes. So, and these are just the bulk packs that you get at Lowe's. So they're, as long as they're natural bristle, you're good to go. Uh, these are called oil sticks and basically oil paint in stick form. You do have to take into consideration the time that it takes oil to dry, but these can be very beautiful if you create grooves in your work and then fill it with oil stick and then wipe, take a little bit of vegetable oil and wipe off the surplus. You can get some really neat lines. Um, um, this is a means of heat. If you're a pyro like me, then a little culinary torch can be a really useful thing. You can also use, I won't bring it over here because it's so big, but a really big um, propane torch that you just want to moderate, you know, your, your closeness to as you use it. Uh, you can make your own paint a couple of different ways. So you don't have to buy it the expensive way. This is me saving a bunch of different random cans and whatnot. You can even use those silicone silicone um, muffin tins. They're not going to melt. Let me show you, well let me tell you about the making your own paint. So these are just oil paints. You can spread a little bit out on a paper towel and let the oil mostly the residue dry out of it or the linseed oil I guess. What will be left is the oil and then you can stir that into your encaustic medium and have a new color. You can also do dry pigment. So I have a whole box of different shades and you can just mix them directly on your hot plate and create new. Uh, then as you make colors that are blended, you just end up with all of these things that pop right out of your out of your tins and so you just have a bunch of options. This is a thing of beeswax. So you can go so far as to go to a beekeeper. I have a friend and get an 11 pound block of beeswax, which 
This is wonderful, but creates issues. You have to melt it down, and you want to add the Damar resin to it. To melt it down, I have this really cool pot. It has a spout on it. So you can put the beeswax in there and melt it in together with the Damar resin, and then you have a clear encaustic medium, and you can do whatever you want to as far as colors go. Um, you can use these to create your blocks. You can also purchase one pound blocks of beeswax. These are usually about 10 bucks a pound if you get it from a beekeeper, but you remember you have to include, you have to add in your Damar resin. So I know this is just like a water a fire hose of information. Hopefully it's it's, it's wonderful information, Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very fascinating. There are a lot of different ways that you can move art around. So I was lucky enough to be the recipient of the, um, of the what do you call this thing? Airbrush <laughs> that was offered up in our art group. And I, I can't do it in here because I've discovered if I run my heater, and my hot plate and my hot gun uh, it kicks off my breaker i've done that several times now and the compressor necessary to use this in here uh, the same thing quickly happens so i can't demonstrate it today but you can use this air that's one of the pictures that i would have shown you that i wasn't able to show you um you can do ocean scenes and you know how you get the wispy waves you can use um, this for that if you're curious and you just think, my God, I can never track all of that, here is a wonderful resource. This is just a book about encaustic art. It's written by Lisa Rankin, L-I-S-S-A, and it really takes you soup to nuts with projects and everything else, and it's, it's a wonderful resource. It kind of shows you what's possible. And you don't have to do like me and do 3D work. I just happen to be fascinated by that because it blends something that I'm already involved in. Um, flat encaustic work is typically what people do and it's amazing. Um, let's see, what time is it? We're right on time, right? Is it 1230? 12.20, 12.25. Okay, good. So I think that is, uh, I mentioned that you can use Andrea ink. Um, I think so that covers safety supplies process. I'm sad that I don't have the chance to paint this bowl in front, you know, for you, but um, I will paint it and then show you what happened. We could also do a workshop at some point if anybody's ever interested. It's, it's really fun stuff. Oh, and there's another item that's you could, I have very few things that are bought that are specifically encaustic. I just make stuff up as I go along, but this is made specifically for encaustic. It is an encaustic stylus, and the intention is to give you a little bit of that control. And you can literally just press it into a block of this wax, and because this is plugged in and hot, it would um, just fill it right up it would fill your reservoir up and then you could draw a straight line i've had some success with that so i think that i've used up our time why don't you ask me any questions that you might have if you are still here and awake <laughs> i have a question about the wood that you um, gather mm -hmm. Um, how long do you have to wait from gathering the wood to when you start chewing? Turn. It's such a great. Just cut down a tree. It would still have a lot of moisture in it. You can turn it what they call green. You would turn it green. It's a beautiful thing because the shavings go flying. It's more shavings than dust. It's like confetti filling the room. 
it's really fun and it's much easier too. It's not so dry. You don't have to resharpen your tool as often. Um, but it has to dry. So as that what causes wood to crack is in uneven drying. So you have to stick it in a paper sack and, you know, change the sack when it gets wet and, and all this. Now that's the beauty of it though. With encaustic, this is something crazy that I discovered. I have two bowls here. So this is a pine bowl and I chose pine because it's, I think it's kind of ugly. It's really boring. It's a very plain wood. Uh, you know, I normally wouldn't turn it, it's got sap. But when I started doing encaustic, it was exactly what I wanted because it turns quickly and I can put paint on some of the pictures that I couldn't show you, I painted, and because one side is not painted and the other one is, there's room for that moisture to leave, but the heat of the wax was doing a lot of the drying. This never, it didn't warp, it didn't, you know, it, the ones that I, I don't have any of them, I gave them away at Christmas. Um, they they never had any issues with cracking at all. And the wood turners are just blown away by that because they will spend hours microwaving for little bursts of 10 seconds at a time just to try to control the drying process and make it go faster. I can put hot encaustic wax in the bowl and use it for dinner that night, which is really cool. 